the political side of it, and then there's the real story. There's a lot to unpack right there. It wasn't quite the interview I thought that was going to be. There's a reason for it. This will be officially my favorite podcast I've ever done. I wonder, Tone, um, what your philosophy is for the audience on Bitcoin and why we need it or don't need it. Oh, uh, we absolutely need Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is absolutely critical to the future of technological and financial innovation. Uh, the one thing that really got me into Bitcoin was the concept of unconfiscatability. Uh, it's a word that does not even exist in the English language today because we've never owned anything that is unconfiscatable. But for the first time in human history, as of 2009, we can own something of value that someone uh, with a law or with a bigger gun uh, cannot take away from you. They can take away everything else, uh, but not the Bitcoin because it uh, exists only in this digital realm and it's protected by a password that you can memorize. Uh, and those incidents, those financial incidents in 2013 of the Cyprus banking confiscation uh, made me see the light that putting some of your wealth in an unconfiscatable asset is absolutely critical. Uh, in addition, Bitcoin is also this censorship resistant value transfer. Uh, so not only can you now hold value in something that can be taken from you, you can now transfer it to anyone in the world uh, without anyone being able to stop you. And we witnessed both of these properties on display once again recently with Russia being kicked off of SWIFT, which is the rail to move uh, dollars around. And also it had its value confiscated from some of the other banks, uh, some of the other central banks. We've seen small incidents of this before, like in the Greek banking crisis in 2015 and the Canadian truckers, uh, the donations of people got their bank accounts frozen, but not on a massive scale. And what we're seeing right now happening with Silicon Valley Bank, again, people didn't have access to their money and uh, they have to go to the bank and they have to ask for permission to move it. And Bitcoin doesn't ask for permission. You can just move your own wealth. What do you think about um, the idea, though, that, like in my case, I have some Bitcoin on Coinbase, personal. Um, what do you think about the idea of, of Coinbase having control of your Bitcoin? I mean, how do, you, how do you see it as a utility if you can't move it around really freely? I mean, by the way, I'm a Bitcoin advocate. We mine every day. Uh, we own about 20,000 miners. I'm a huge fan of the process and a believer that the digital asset is here to stay. Um, but where would you, how would you hold it? Like if, you're, if, you, if you think about being able to use it, in what capacity would you be able to use it in your mind? Like what, what do you envision happening? So I advise people to take custody of their own Bitcoin and something like Coinbase is a custodian of your Bitcoin. So it is a difference of holding the cash in your house or holding the cash at the bank. Now, there's only so much cash you can hold in your house. Uh, there's a couple of risks with that. Uh, one of those risks is, of course, your house could be robbed, uh, which is one of the reasons why people hold a lot of their money at the bank instead. Uh, and the other is you can't really buy everything with cash. If you want to buy from Amazon, it's very, very difficult to buy it with cash. Now, Bitcoin, on the other hand, it does make it a lot easier for you to take full custody of the asset being Bitcoin and then still use it from your own custody. Now, a person who believes in Bitcoin, of course, it's better uh, to have any exposure to Bitcoin than zero exposure to Bitcoin. Uh, so uh, keeping your Bitcoin at Coinbase is a start, uh, but you wanna go past that. You wanna take the responsibility and hold on to that Bitcoin in your own cold storage uh, there are wallets. Some people are scared of that responsibility, uh, but it is important. So that's more what I advocate uh, because spending your Bitcoin from your as your own custodian or Coinbase as your custodian doesn't make any difference at all. And this is the big difference between holding cash in your house and holding your cash at the bank. Uh, but when it comes to these 
uh, financial panics or confiscation or censorship, uh, those properties don't really help you uh, when you're holding your Bitcoin at Coinbase. Uh, the only property of Bitcoin that you are taking advantage of is the fact that Bitcoin has a finite supply. Uh, and because of that finite supply, as demand for Bitcoin rises, Bitcoin has no choice but to go up in price. So you are taking advantage of that aspect of Bitcoin, but not its censorship resistance and not its unconfiscatability. The unconfiscatability, and I'm gonna say that a few more times. Uh, if I say it three times fast, I'll be an expert. As I asked my producer how to pronounce it, I kind of knew, thought I, well, how you were, what you were trying to achieve there. But I can't think of something more true. I've seen these scenarios where people are driving through cities in America, they get pulled over by the police, they have 12,000 worth of cash. The cash is taken from them. The local police station can keep the cash and it's almost impossible to get your money back under the Seizure Act because they suspected poor activity and it's impossible pretty much to get it back. Um, the, corruptibili yeah, the, corruptibili right. the corruptibility of what people can do to you, obviously. Um, I, I don't know that I could be more uh, on the same page with you. So these are like, you and I are two people holding hands, skipping together saying, we love Bitcoin. Um, and I, I really believe that, but it's, it's, it's interesting today that we're having a conversation the day after Signature Bank is seized in which really was the Bitcoin miners bank and Silvergate gone, Silicon Valley gone. It makes more of a case. You see Bitcoin rallying to 24,000 today. I like to see the disconnect there. Um, but yeah, you... I'm gonna switch screens. Yeah, here's the unconfiscatable background. I love that word so much. By the way, I own the .com, in case you're wondering. Uh, that, that's how much of a fan I am of that concept. Right. But what, what, do you, what do you make of the fact that it just appears, if you're reading Scaramucci, what he's saying is that it seems like the US is trying to ruin the idea that they're the backbone of, the backbone of Bitcoin but I don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle. What is your hypothesis around what's happening with the banks right now? Silvergate Bank uh, was a major bank for the crypto industry, uh, which really focused on a lot of the risky side of the crypto industry. Uh, the FTXs, the circles, BlockFi. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of the stuff that Silvergate did uh, was pretty risky and they got themselves into trouble. Signature Bank is also a bank for the crypto industry, but from what I'm seeing this morning, people aren't sure why exactly uh, the government, and by the government, I mean the Fed, the Treasury, and the FDIC all together, uh, all of a sudden uh, took over Signature Bank. It's a little bit questionable, and it throws up that conspiracy theory. They kind of want to rub it into the crypto space because that bank was not uh, completely insolvent yet. It could have gotten there, but not yet. That was a little premature. And the Silicon Valley Bank is a completely different issue. That one is unrelated to crypto altogether. Uh, the only crypto company that seems to have uh, had problems with that was Circle, which is the creator of USDC stablecoin, which had 25% of the backing of that coin in cash and 10% of that cash happened to be on deposit at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, but they are gonna make all the depositors whole. So that's not really an issue. Uh, that bank had completely uh, different problems. Yeah, but where do people go now? I mean, it's a strange thing. I noticed that Gemini, they use Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan and State Street but two major banks around crypto, Silvergate and Signature are effectively gone now. I mean, or at least it feels that way with Signature. So that, that is true. And the crypto industry will have a little bit of a struggle uh, having that on and off ramp into the fiat crypto, into the, into the fiat realm. Uh, but there's also a couple of things here. Bitcoin is very different than crypto. Uh, there is Bitcoin and then there is everything else in the crypto space. And Bitcoin is as different 
from everything in crypto as Bitcoin is different from say Amazon stock. So to me, uh, Ethereum token is a lot closer to being a security uh, of the corporation Ethereum, which has a CEO, a board of directors, everything. So I equate Ethereum on par with Amazon stock and the Ethereum product is competing with AWS, which is one of the main products of Amazon. So Bitcoin is different. And while there are a lot of companies that do need that bridge from uh, Bitcoin into fiat, there are a couple of banks that will bank the big reputable companies. Uh, and also it's time that Bitcoin started developing or the Bitcoin ecosystem started developing its own circular economy because Bitcoin does act like a currency and it does have its own rails. Think of the US dollar as the currency, the SWIFT banking system is the rails to move the US dollar. Bitcoin and Bitcoin, they're named the same, but they're different. There's Bitcoin, the network, usually referred to with a capital B, and then Bitcoins, the digital asset, usually referred to with a lowercase b. Those of us that have been around for a while, that distinction is very clear for us. But for the average person, you do need to explain that Bitcoin, the asset moves on Bitcoin, the rails, and you can eventually move to a circular economy where you are just staying in Bitcoin. Of course, this gets better when the price of Bitcoin rises and people are more willing to hold on to the Bitcoin they receive. So a lot of these Bitcoin companies, they may want to try to have a bigger push to convince more of their employees to accept their salary in Bitcoin to denominate their salary in Bitcoin, at least part of it. Hey, I'm gonna pay you 0.1 Bitcoin a month uh, and the rest I'll pay in US dollar. Uh, slowly convince their suppliers, hey, do you wanna accept Bitcoin? Until we get to the circular economy where people are earning money in Bitcoin and they're paying for all their expenses in Bitcoin and they don't need the traditional fiat rails. Now we're still years and years away from that, oh, yeah, we but are. this situation, mm. uh, we're speeding it up. Uh, Russia, China, Brazil, India, we're years away from getting off the, the US SWIFT system, but with sanctions on Russia, that sped up the process. So sometimes you get these shocks that force the system to speed up what was already slowly happening. Uh, the financial summit is a really awesome event uh, for the intermediate to advance a trader or investor. Uh, the website is thefinancialsummit.com. Uh, it's called Financial Summit. I try to connect young, talented traders that have some success because this event is not cheap. Uh, we host it for five nights, very high-end resorts. Uh, and I want to introduce the young, hungry traders that have success to the money manager that they can help scale uh, their ideas. Uh, I also try to bring together uh, financial services that do cater to traders and higher level investors. So there's some VC representation, uh, also exchanges, brokers. Uh, we try to uh, get the mining industry there because uh, mining industry, uh, if you're mining Bitcoin, it's very important for you to have an idea of the financial markets because you have to hedge the Bitcoin that you've already mined and you want to hold on to or hedge the Bitcoin you're anticipating on mining. Uh, so you do need a trader on your team or someone that understands the futures markets. And an event like this tries to connect either individual uh, traders with experience or uh, companies that help manage uh, these kinds of problems for uh, a Bitcoin miner. Uh, while at the same time, the Bitcoin miner could definitely find people uh, that might invest in their mining operation. So it's an amazing networking event for about five days uh, for that intermediate to advanced financial professional. Hmm. How often do you have it? Uh, it's once or twice a year. It really depends on the market conditions. Uh, last year was rough because of the big bear market. Uh, we tried doing two of them last year. It was a little bit challenging. Uh, people tightened their belts. Uh, so this year we're going to do one towards the end of the year, uh, but then the year after, hopefully two or three. And it's designed for about 50 people. It is family friendly uh, because it's five days. 
So if someone does want to bring their uh, wife or their husband, uh, it's a very small additional cost because uh, uh, we do try to structure it as a uh, family friendly event. For the people out there that don't know you, uh, and there's plenty of people that don't know me, and I presume there's some that don't know you, probably not many, what, uh, how'd you get started? Uh, with the event or in the world of, of the crypto? Just sort of your background. You've been at this a long time, you know, 10 years. Oh, yeah. And I, I think we have some similar backgrounds. I'd, I'd just love the public to be able to hear how you got started. So I spent way too much time uh, in universities. I have three degrees. I have a degree in mathematics. I have a degree in geology. Uh, and I have a degree in financial engineering. Uh, that got me started on Wall Street, ironically, Bear Stearns. Uh, so I've been through one of these before, one of these financial panics before. Uh, I worked on Wall Street for about 10 years uh, on a quant team, uh, mostly focused on building risk models. It was around 2013-14 where Bitcoin became very interesting to me. I already started going down the path of sound money, gold, silver, and then 2013-14, uh, Bitcoin became of interest. In 2015, I actually quit to be a trader, even though my job mostly revolved around the risk side of the financial space. My passion was always for uh, the trade side of the financial space. I quit to be a trader, but the main reason for like not having a boss is to not have a boss, to be on your own, to travel, uh, to enjoy life while making money in trading. And I ended up getting very fulfilled by becoming uh, I guess the term influencer is the popular term, uh, even though I don't like it, but I started a YouTube channel just talking about what I knew about finance, investing and trading. The YouTube channel grew, started becoming a speaker at many conferences until eventually I started organizing my own conferences. So right now I do very little trading, uh, but I educate people on trading and I'll always go back to it when I'm ready to retire and step back from the public life and the travel life. Do you have a, a favorite place that people go buy Bitcoin today? Yeah, Swan. Uh, so Swan is my recommendation. If you're looking to buy uh, Bitcoin, uh, check out Swan. Uh, and uh, they are uh, very proactive in encouraging you that after you buy Bitcoin from them, yes, they can hold it for you, uh, but they are very proactive in helping you take it off of their custody and into your own custody. And the reason why I like them is because they understand Bitcoin and uh, they're not in it just for the business. They're in it to help you uh, do better with your Bitcoin and get away from a traditional banking system. Swan, is this, uh, do they sell other crypto or just uh, just Bitcoin? Just Bitcoin. They'll, they'll accept your crypto if you want to convert it into Bitcoin, but they're specifically focused on only Bitcoin. And uh, say, just like me, so our uh, views on the crypto space are aligned. Uh, I don't work for them, but that is uh, my favorite company that I recommend for people uh, to buy their Bitcoin from. Got it. What do, you, uh, what do you think next? I mean, do you have uh, price targets in your mind or do you not pay attention to price targets for Bitcoin? What do, you, what do you suggest to the average person who's still kind of leery of, like it was 69,000, it was 16,000, it's 24,000. What are you suggesting to them now? So my, my own YouTube channel mostly uh, caters to traders. Uh, so talking about the price of Bitcoin uh, is what gets me the most views, even though I'd rather talk politics, but that's okay. Uh, one day I'll switch the channels. Uh, but for now, yeah, so in my view, I believe that we have bottomed. Nothing is ever certain, uh, but I am pretty confident that the $15,500 price uh, was the bottom. I am also pretty confident as of the last 24 to 48 hours that the secondary low of $20,000 is also uh, very, very likely to stay. Uh, I believe the bull market has finally arrived uh, and I am anticipating uh, prices to generally go up other than pullbacks uh, for the next 12 to 18 months into the next bull cycle. Uh, now, again, anything can happen, not trading advice, uh, but the way I'm looking at it is I think that the Bitcoin price can realistically uh, hit 50,000 or that vicinity by end of year. Uh, then the Bitcoin halving is coming. And this also four year cycle tends to 
uh, raise the price a little bit uh, going into the halving. That's how it's always, it always was. I don't believe it'll be different this time. I think it'll stay to form. Uh, and after that, in the next bull run, uh, over the next three to four years, uh, I would be very surprised if Bitcoin isn't breaking uh, 200,000 or that quarter million mark in this bull cycle. To me, that's realistic, uh, but also I am a believer that this technology is going to revolutionize the world. So you see a 10x return from here? I do. I, I, I see a 10x return in the next bull cycle, followed by its usual, you know, 50 plus percent correction. And the faster and quicker we go up, the bigger the pain. Uh, the slower we move into that quarter million target, probably the, 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 the less the pain. So it really depends on how far you get there. If we go to a quarter mil this year, there's going to be a monster crash. So I don't really want to see it go up that high quickly. Uh, that causes its own problems, like with the dot-com and many others. After the dot-com bubble in 2000, people don't realize it took 15 years for the NASDAQ to break the all-time high. The iPhone came out in 2007, and it still took another eight years to break the all-time high. Whenever the market goes into these exponential, unreasonable bubbles, uh, they overcorrect, and then they take a lot longer to get back to the top. It happened to Microsoft. There was a whole decade where Microsoft traded uh, down, basically, or flat for more than a decade after the breakup of Microsoft, where they the government said they should be broken up, and then the settlement of Microsoft later on. Uh, it, there was a whole, they called the lost decade for Microsoft, where basically there was, other than some dividends, there was no price appreciation. Uh, and after dot com, it, the same thing happened. It took a long time for that, that sort of cleanup to happen. Um, we get these secular bull markets that, that take place. Um, where, I don't know where you call home, but I was curious where you think, uh, what states in your mind now are the most Bitcoin friendly? I think Texas and Florida are going to be are going to be the most Bitcoin friendly states. Uh, so my home was New York while I was working on Wall Street. After that, once I went off on my own, uh, one of the events I host is in Las Vegas. I was uh, a resident of Las Vegas. Uh, these days, uh, I call home Panama and uh, Florida. Uh, the COVID situation really bothered me. Uh, I wanted to go anywhere where there's freedom. The more your country or your state locked down, uh, the less I wanted to have anything to do with that region. Uh, so. I have somewhat of a pessimistic view on the future of the United States dominating the world. Uh, and I would rather be down in the south of the United States. Uh, and I think that area is going to be a lot more friendlier to free markets, to capitalism. And Bitcoin itself is as capitalist as it gets. Uh, Texas is getting so many jobs from uh, Bitcoin mining uh, that uh, they're going to fight this 30% tax on Bitcoin mining that uh, the current administration wants to put on uh, the space. So, uh, yeah, so I, I think though those jurisdictions are going to be a lot friendlier. Also, Wyoming is a great state. They're trying to do a lot of great things in Bitcoin as well. What about Montana? Uh, Montana is, uh, is pretty good. Uh, if we get into the real geopolitics situation, uh, there is a reason to be careful of Montana. Uh, but uh, I don't know how geopolitical your channel gets. That's another major interest of mine. And I'm slowly pivoting my, uh, my channel and my commentary more into geopolitics and slowly away from Bitcoin. It's just hard because all these events are happening. Uh, Montana's not bad. Uh, it is a red state. I prefer red states to blue states. Uh, but I'd rather be down south. Uh, Wyoming has a little bit of an exception, uh, but other than that, other than Wyoming, I'd rather be down south. So you're a Bitcoin purist in the sense that you don't own own any other form of crypto? Uh, correct. I've actually never owned a single Ethereum. And uh, I just don't see them as revolutionary technology. I see them more uh, like companies. And there's nothing wrong with speculating on companies. When I was a trader, I mostly traded the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500. 
Uh, those were the stocks I traded. I never got into penny stocks. I never wanted to trade that three cent company. Yes, it can make me 100% in a few hours or 1000% in a week. It's possible. But I didn't want to be in that realm. Uh, I didn't want to uh, trade those companies. And to me, every token in the crypto space other than Bitcoin is reminds me of those penny stock trading days uh, versus something more stable. I see Bitcoin as more of a protocol. To me, Bitcoin is the next layer of the internet. But back in the 90s, you had no opportunity to invest in the internet itself. You couldn't own pieces of the internet that go up in value as the internet gets more and more useful. You had no choice but to choose winners and losers that were utilizing the internet. Amazon was a winner, pets.com didn't make it. You had to choose these winners and losers. To me, Bitcoin is that backbone. And while the easy money has already been made, uh, it doesn't mean that it still can't go 10x or 20x over the next few years uh, as everything else gets built on top of it or around it uh, instead of gambling on these crypto companies early on. So, but as a trader, there's nothing wrong with speculation, but I would never hold any of these other cryptos for longer than the trade is telling me to hold it. I was always a swing trader a week to a few months is as long as I used to hold uh, a stock. And that's how I would treat all of these other cryptos. But Bitcoin is something that you can actually hold on to for years and years, in my view. What do you think about stuff being built on the network? I mean, this is really, I, there are advances now in Bitcoin in terms of uh, speed and lightning, et cetera. But what do you, are there any favorite products you have that are being built on the network? So a lot of people accuse the Bitcoin network of being too slow and too old. Uh, so there's two parts here. One, the Bitcoin network is way too important to the world for people to move, break things on it. So the Bitcoin code must be stable. So that's priority one. So that makes Bitcoin a little bit slower or a lot slower to make any changes, but that's also what brings it its stability. Uh, the second part is in order to keep Bitcoin decentralized, there is very limited things you can do directly into the Bitcoin protocol. Because if you start increasing the block size and some of these other ideas, Bitcoin would start to lose its only competitive advantage on everything in this world and the crypto space being the only decentralized protocol of trustless trust. You trust the fact that it's trustless. So you have to build either on uh, as a quasi connection to it. The Lightning Network allows Bitcoin to scale for small payments. The liquid side chain creates a bit of an Ethereum competitor that if you do need to build your token on top of something like uh, on top of a decentralized protocol, you can now do it on Bitcoin, which is actually decentralized instead of doing it on top of Ethereum, which I see as centralized. But because Bitcoin is trying to build all these things simultaneously, making everybody happy and not moving too fast, it feels like it's moving slowly because it's uh, advancing multiple areas at the same time. So everything is coming. And uh, I think that eventually everything would move to be on top of Bitcoin through its secondary, second layer and third layer solutions. Uh, but it'll just take a little more time for people to migrate over as these other protocols prove to be uh, not as secure. All right, so let, let, let's get into a little bit of technical analysis. I'm not gonna keep this too long. I know a lot of people think of it as tea leaves. I'm gonna jump over to screen share. So this is the daily chart. And over the last three to four days, I have been saying that the $20,000 low uh, was almost too perfect from a TA perspective. Uh, we had two critical daily moving averages. Uh, we had the 128, which is actually critical in Bitcoin and the 200 day. Uh, we had the hammer candle. I have an indicator called the MRI and these arrows do show up in real time. They don't show up in hindsight. 
Uh, and uh, that indicated to me that there's a high probability of a rebound. And also the macro picture with these banks and the way that went down. On a weekly scale, the picture also looks incredible. I anticipated Bitcoin to pull back when it ran into a triple resistance at the $25,000 level. Oh, sorry, that was my four day chart. Here is the weekly chart. Uh, I expected a pullback to that $20,000 level from this triple resistance and the depth cross that was coming a couple of weeks ago. I'm now am anticipating Bitcoin to break above that $25,000 level and probably never look back. So from a TA perspective, I am as bullish on Bitcoin right now as I have been in the last nine years, I've been actively following the space. Uh, so I first started writing articles on Cointelegraph about the price of Bitcoin in 2014, in the summer of 2014. So in a few months, that's a nine year anniversary. I am, I'm personally am as bullish right now. I think this is a pivotal moment where people are gonna start paying a lot of attention uh, to Bitcoin and the banking system. I joke around saying that because of the access to information that we now have that we didn't have 10 years ago, uh, in 2020, suddenly everyone became a medical expert. Uh, all you needed was your cell phone. 2021, uh, after the election, everyone became you know, an election specialist. In 2022, everyone became a war expert and a geopolitical expert. And this is the year of everyone being an expert on government debt, on uh, treasury bonds, on yields. Uh, this is the year. Everyone's about to be a financial expert. So to me, uh, everything is aligning. We're going into a cycle, uh, this four-year cycle where Bitcoin tends to rise. We just had the big extended bear market. Uh, the, the way these banks are falling apart, uh, it's not like the 2008. It's very, very different. And this is very uh, good for the Bitcoin ecosystem, the way it's happening. And the technical analysis picture is just absolutely perfect. Uh, so I'm very, very happy right yeah, now. Yeah, I do a lot of technical analysis and I thought uh, you and I are we're, we're very well aligned, you and I, on where things are. Um, I, uh, I'm pretty bullish on it. It looks like it'll break above 25. Um, I mean, obviously, there was an inflection point for me, and I'm, you know, I've been a trader for such a long time. I ran a hedge fund for 12 years. I run a different hedge fund today. And the thing that I saw in December and the collapse of FTX were those crescendo bottoms that take place when the news is the worst it could be, right? Uh, you really want to like, if you recall the, the day, and this is probably, you might be too young for this, but if you recall the day that um, the, the bullets started flying in the first Gulf War against Iraq, you saw this big bottom when people's nervousness was at the highest point, which is that we're firing, and oh my God, the Republican Guard's gonna kill all these Americans. But you could see that bottom put in in that sort of time frame in the 92 area, 91 and a half area where uh, um, Iraq was liberated, right? And you see these events where people, the emotions get caught up and FTX to me was the bottom. Um, and when we saw Signature Bank uh, BCs yesterday, I was on the phone with another trader friend of mine who works for me. And I said, if Bitcoin rallies off this news, it's a case for Bitcoin, and sure enough, we were up a thousand, like five hundred bucks, pretty quickly. Then a thousand bucks, and then of course now we've held that that number as people started to think about, well, where does Bitcoin fit in the ecosystem? And it actually endorses the thesis that we need something that's not controlled by the banking system, right? I mean, this is actually the narrative that we Bitcoiners have been paying attention to, which is like, look, we're telling you, you need to be your own bank. You need to have some of your own, your own, um, as you say it, unconfiscatable uh, assets. Um, I'd love to talk more to you. I'm gonna have my producer reach out to you. We're gonna, we own a thing, something called bitnile.com, which is a live metaverse product. And that product is gonna be introducing the ability to buy 
uh, and use over 20 different forms of crypto, including Bitcoin, for payment for things. Uh, we're Bitcoin-centric, so your reward is in Bitcoin, but we're going to take over di 20 different forms of, of, of Bitcoin and about 22 different forms of fiat globally in 176 countries. I appreciate your time. Tone, is there anything you want to say to the audience beforehand, th things you want to plug that are important to you that's coming up, events for you, your family, things going on in, uh, in your space, whether it be the financial summit or things you're doing? Uh, yeah, sure. That would be great. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, just going to go to screen share real quick. Unconfiscatable is actually a conference. Uh, I didn't know what to do with that domain after I bought it back in 2015, I think, or 2016. And I paid $12 for it, which is amazing because it was just available. Uh, and we did a conference. So this is a Bitcoin conference that educates people about Bitcoin, has a poker tournament. Uh, would love to see you there. It's in Las Vegas. Uh, hence the poker tournament and uh, hopefully uh, I'll see a lot of people there and the other event that I host is the financial summit uh, just go to the financial the financial summit.com check it out uh, we do have testimonial videos videos from the event and hopefully people will come and join other than that uh, you can find me on YouTube everything else is under the tone face brand YouTube Twitter Instagram uh, just too many social media apps to try and keep an eye on. But these are the events I host and I love meeting people in, in person and talking to them in person. Real, real quick thing for your TA. So that MRI indicator that I have, it's a personal version of the Tom DeMarc indicator, TD oh, wow. indicator. Yeah, wow. Is that something you ever used? Yep, I did. I used it. I, I DeMarc and I used, uh, I have a Bloomberg. So DeMarc is available on Bloomberg too also. So, so the mark was something I, I used, like it wasn't my, the only thing, like you never use one single TA, mm -hmm. but the DeMarc indicator was one of my main forms of trading back in the day. Oh, and when TradingView came out, I'm sure you use TradingView all the time. I needed Tom DeMarc to be on TradingView and it didn't exist. So I wrote my own code. Like I wrote the Tom DeMarc indicator on TradingView and because I needed it. And then when I did streams, I would you know, talk about it. And then other people wanted, all of a sudden I introduced, I was the guy that introduced the Tom DeMarc indicator to all of the crypto space. That's funny. Because I was the only guy that was doing it. And then I started, well, it took me forever to write this code. And I wanted to give Tom DeMarc credit. Uh, I didn't want to steal it. I don't want to say it's the tone base indicator when in reality it was, uh, you know, because I needed it for myself. But so I had to, so I was like, kind of selling access to it real cheap. I didn't want to just give it away for free. And then I ended up getting sued by Tom DeMarc. Uh, really? Yeah, but, uh, but we, we, uh, we resolved it. But as part of the thing, I had to rename it to the MRI, but it's not exactly Tom DeMarc. I had my own changes there, right? So there was two problems. One, I have, a, I don't want to say better than Tom DeMarc uh, indicator because that's subjective but it's better for me. So there were certain things in the Tom DeMarc indicator that I altered, but they were, I don't wanna say they were minor, but they were important enough, but it was like a five to 10% deviation from the Tom DeMarc indicator. So it's not exactly the Tom DeMarc indicator. I can't call it the Tom DeMarc indicator. So I had to call it something else. So uh, as long as I don't do things like say the number nine, I'm okay. So I had to, uh, so the MRI indicator is, you know, 90% Tom DeMarc and 10% my own alter, uh, additions. And that called the bottom three days ago, absolutely spot on. I, I can tell you there's a thing called a Streisand effect, you know, where uh, Barbara Streisand didn't want her house on, yeah. on the internet. Aware, yeah, Eight yeah. people saw it and then she sued somebody over it. And yeah. 8,000 people saw the, the lawsuit. And so uh, it's probably an endorsement of your skill set that Tom mm -hmm. DeMarc sued you for sure. I would probably say that's that's probably a badge of honor, my friend. So yeah, ha happy to chat again anytime. Uh, just hit me up. I'll DM you on uh, Twitter if you want to shoot me your number. Uh, it's uh, yeah. I'll just I'll, I'll send it to you. On, I'll send it to you on Twitter for sure. Perfect. All right. All right. Take care. Thanks for Thanks being again. with us, everybody. Tone Vase. Vase. Am I saying that right? Vase. Vase. Yeah. Uh, what ethnicity is that, by the way? 
So I was born in the Soviet Union, uh, and I'm half Russian, half Ukrainian. Uh, there you go. I, I, it's insane right now. Yeah, and I came to the U.S. in 1990, like before communism fell. Bayes, appreciate it, Tone. I uh, appreciate your time. You know, I'm going to explain to you real quick. Continue walking. But don't be rolling yet. There's a reason for it. So, so I did get that right. I did get that yeah, right. Yeah, you got it right.